Olá, amigos do Mosaico, muito boa noite. Sejam todos muito bem-vindos ao programa Mais Tempo no Ar na televisão brasileira. Hoje traremos a última retrospectiva do ano de 2023. Vamos rever a entrevista com David Badio, dicas culturais, cantora Fortuna e muito mais. No Easy Shailot, eu mesmo saí nas ruas da cidade para saber se o pessoal sabia o que era Harkadá. Será que acertaram? Eu duvido. Pode rodar. Salve, salve, amigos e amigas do Mosaico. Estamos aqui nas incríveis ruas paulistanas mais uma vez para mais um Super Easy Shailot. Você sabe que a dança permeia a nossa cultura judaica, certo? Você conhece muito bem o Arkadá, a nossa dança do povo, a nossa dança típica, mas eu duvido que o pessoal na rua conhece. Essa é mais uma missão. Ó o meu passinho de Arkadá aqui, ó. Já tô no groove para o Vitor em mais um Easy Shailot. Você é de casa, vem comigo, bora! Você já ouviu falar de Arkadá? Como? Arkadá. Não, não ouvi. Não? Pra falar sinceramente, não. É, perdoe minha ignorância. Opção A, é um prato, é uma dança. Opção C, Arcadá é uma cidade. Junta aqui vocês três, forte! Dança. Uma dança. Uma cidade. Recife. Acho que é uma dança. Aí, garoto, esse sabe tudo. Arcadá, ou baile de dança circular israelense, surgiu juntamente com a criação do Estado de Israel. Suas coreografias são produzidas em Israel desde lá do início do século XX, sendo passadas de geração para geração. Anualmente, novas danças para Arkadá são criadas por vários coreógrafos israelenses. Vamos ver se o teu hebraico está afiado. O que significa Arkadá? Você já ouviu falar? Nunca, nunca vi, nem sei que diabo é isso. <risos> ah, se eu não tivesse pesado aqui, eu dançaria. Vamos ver se a gente consegue dançar junto. Arkadá é uma dança religiosa, opção A. Opção B é uma dança com saltos. Opção C, uma dança do povo. Arkadá é... Como é que é? Como é que é? Uma dança religiosa que salta e o povo todo pode fazer. Ah, ele, de todas maneiras, a dança do povo pode ser. Ainda que relativamente nova, Arkadá se tornou um hábito nas comunidades judaicas. A hebraica, por exemplo, tem um grupo e é reconhecida como uma expressão folclórica israelense. Em hebraico, rikud significa dança e am significa povo. Arkadá é o nome dado ao encontro para a prática de rikud am, ou seja, danças do povo. Então, eu tô, tô buscando parceiros para dançar comigo. Você acha que a gente consegue fazer aqui uma dancinha? Para cá, pay, pay, play. Com esse grupo especialíssimo e o meu professor de dança, a gente finaliza essa matéria, mais um Ace and Shailot. Eu volto para o estúdio. Valeu! Vamos para um rápido intervalo e voltamos já já com mais Mosaico na TV. Com a Tribuna Judaica, você se mantém sempre informado sobre todos os acontecimentos da nossa comunidade no Brasil e no mundo. Assine a Tribuna Judaica e não perca nada do que acontece. Ligue 0800 55 10 18. O judaísmo tem regras e costumes para se despedir de um ente querido. E para cumpri-los, contamos com profissionais e voluntários. Nós nos orgulhamos muito deles, dos profissionais que compreendem que seu dia a dia é diferente e especial, e dos voluntários, cujo único pagamento é a certeza de estar colaborando com nossas famílias. Hevra Kadisha, mantendo acesa a chama da comunidade. O Mosaico conversou com exclusividade, é claro, com o autor britânico David Badil durante o Festival Literário Judaico. Vamos rever essa entrevista. O Museu Judaico está realizando um festival de literatura, trouxe cinco autores estrangeiros para falarem de literatura judaica. É, o mais festejado deles é David Badio, que escreveu um livro surpreendente, que em inglês se chama Jews Don't Count, e que acaba de ser traduzido, Judeus Não Contam. É, como ele é escritor, comediante é, e dez outras coisas, eu achei que seria uma conversa 
muito interessante para a gente ter. David, thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. My pleasure. So we can talk about the ideas behind this book. Okay. First of all, I mean, you probably heard a hundred times. Why did you write this book? Um, well, I wrote this book because um, for a while, really quite a long time, I've been noticing something specific about uh, the way that people thought, uh, not just about Jews, but about minorities in general. This was in the UK, but I felt that it was more or less global. But in the last sort of 20 years, uh, there'd been a very deep intensification uh, of the way that people were concerned about minorities. So what we now call, I guess, identity politics, but really the way that progressive people in particular had established a narrative whereby we care a lot about racism and discrimination, about inclusion, about representation, about all those things. And what I noticed was that Jews were not included in that concern. That wasn't a big deal for any, anyone who was talking about that. I, I mean, I would say over the last 20 years, uh, in a, a good way, a good way, there's been a massive correction in the way that people have thought about minorities, except Jews. Um, and this uh, accepting of Jews, this missing out of Jews from that conversation is what made me want to write the book. Uh, why? Why <laughs> are Jews uh, forgotten in the conversation? Okay, so the book, uh, it begins with about 12 different examples of what I'm talking about. Yes. And these range from sort of high literary examples. So, for example, I remember listening to BBC and they had decided to begin New Year's Day, it's only a couple of years ago, with the reading of all of T.S. Eliot's poetry. And so if you read all of T.S. Eliot's poetry, you'll read a poem that says, the rats are underneath the piles, the Jews are underneath the lot. And this is not something that you would even be allowed for any other minority for the BBC. You just would never have such a negative stereotype. So it goes from that to anti-Semitism at football matches, not being policed, et cetera, et cetera. It's, a, it's about to... And then, so it covers a wide range of ground, but at heart it comes down to, um, well, it comes down to a few things, but the most basic thing is that the reason that Jews are left out of that conversation is that most minorities are thought of as vulnerable, as oppressed, uh, as poor, as non-white, and Jews are thought of the, as the opposite. Jews are thought of as powerful and rich and privileged and white. And that disqualifies them in the minds of some progressives from allyship, from going out and supporting and marching and trying to help Jews, because it's considered that Jews are not powerless. If anything, they're considered to be the powerful. And what's wrong with that is that Jewish history is an endless loop of disempowerment. Um, I get very upset with the idea that we're being punished for not crying all the time and trying to move on whatever the difficulties we have. Right. Uh, I mean, could it be related historically to something else? Um, well, I, I, I think it's, it's fairly constant in history that, uh, that the vulnerability of Jews, the fact that Jews do get persecuted is something that is not really remembered as much as you would expect. Uh, I would say that if you look at the way that Jews are imagined, Jews are imagined all the time and going back a long way as high status. This is unique amongst the way that people think about minorities. Most minorities are thought of as low status, as sort of animalistic and you know, thieving and poor and all the rest of it. And Jews get that, but they also get this sense of being in control of the world, in control of money. And that goes back to, in Britain, you know, Jews were blood libeled in the 12th century because aristocrats thought that they had too much control of money this is even in the 12th century, and they didn't want to repay debts to Jews, and so they created the blood libel in order to have people massacre Jews. And that's already, even then, an idea of Jews having too much power. Uh, you wrote this book two years ago, more or less? Yeah, I think it came out two years ago. I started writing it three years ago, but it's it came out. It's kind of like you were guessing that something terrible, <laughs> like the war yeah. uh, in the Middle East right now, would happen. Uh, is there something that happened in the last few years? Did you see a crescendo in the anti-Semitism that took you to write the book? Um, 
not when I wrote, well, when I wrote it in Britain, there was a lot of talk at the time, I just, or the, just at the end of the time, uh, about the British Labour Party, the British left, who were uh, having their own anti-Semitism crisis. So there was suddenly this strange thing in Britain where Jews who are a tiny minority in Britain, really a small minority, uh, they're suddenly on the, in the newspapers, anti-Semitism in the newspapers, and the whole of the left in Britain is arguing about whether or not the leader of the Labour Party is an anti-Semite. These big, and so I felt there was a lot of confusion about the left and anti-Semitism, and that was partly why I wrote the book then. Now, I think we're in a situation where a lot of the things that I'm talking about, it's not that they've come true exactly, but that a lot of people have write to me now and say the only thing that seems to make sense at the present moment is what you've written about, particularly in terms of the reaction. It's not so much what's happening in the Middle East. Yes. It's the reaction from le mainly left-wing people in the West, the erasure of the idea that there is Jewish pain, there is violence against Jews, there is uh, any sense in which Jewish concern about what's happening needs to be in the mix. That's the whole point I'm saying. Jews are not, the reality of Jews is not in the conversation. No one is talking about how Jews feel at the present moment. Not at all. Uh, would you say that we didn't promote, I'm not sure promote is the right verb here, but would you say that we didn't defend our cause or our group of people uh, in the right way? We always thought it's not important, we don't care what you say. Uh, no, I don't know if that's true. Well, so it's a good question. In Britain, I don't know about in Brazil, in Britain, Jews for a long time, the only place I think this is not true, it might, I'm sure, I think it is true in Brazil, but it's not true only maybe in parts of New York and Israel, Jews tend to keep their heads down. Jews tend to say, we don't want to cause trouble. If there is anti-Semitism, we'd rather not talk about it. Let's just leave it mm -hmm. and it'll go away. Yes. That's what Jews tend to do. Uh -huh. And that, this book is not like that. This book is very militant about Jews should speak about anti-Semitism. Interesting that you say uh, the book is militant because somewhere here it's clear that you don't want to make a point, you don't want to win the argument. Yeah. You just want to bring the argument yeah. to the table. That's true. That's true. Well, there is not an argument to be won, I don't think, although some people might think there is, but I think it's more about saying uh, I'm trying to deconstruct a mindset. Here is the anti-Semitic mindset. It's, it's changed, or at least it's got a new version in recent years, uh, and I particularly am looking at, which perhaps we should have said earlier, a, a type of anti-Semitism that comes from an unexpected place. Because I think people think anti-Semitism comes mainly from the right, and, it's, and it does. From the far right, it still does. But this, I'm talking really about people who imagine themselves as being very, very anti-racist, very anti-discrimination, and yet they still have this blind spot about Jews, right? And so what I'm really doing is just deconstructing that mindset. Why is it like that? And then laying it out. I'm not really saying what should happen. I just hope that something will happen, but I don't explain what will happen. I read a few days ago some kind of um, um, an article that said, all what's happening today has to do with the generation of the Vietnam War that became teachers, and those teachers were radical leftists. Uh, they formed a new generation of teachers, and there is only one way of to looking at things, and always the word colonialism comes in, uh, no matter if it's not true, but we're blamed for things that we don't even know uh, how, to, how to address. Uh, Somebody was interviewing uh, a terrorist leader at Sky News in Australia, and the lady starts the interview saying, uh, what, would, what would you say, uh, how long will this ceasefire take? And the gentleman starts answering, it's not a ceasefire. So uh, the conversation becomes almost impossible because uh, whatever seems to be uh, a fact, suddenly it's not. Uh, okay, so can I just go back to the first yes. thing you said? Yes. So I, I don't know, uh, it's an interesting idea about um, beginning with the activism against Vietnam, that, that might be true. But my book uh, is very much uh, influenced, I think, by social media. Uh, uh -huh. Because I think social media has created a particular narrative of looking at the world. Remember, social media is a performative space, right? It allows people to go on stage almost and say, this is who I am. And that yes. turbocharges 
how people want to be seen. And how they want to be seen, in my documentary, I made a documentary about this, yes. Jonathan Safran Fur, who's a writer, said it makes people think about the world just in terms of the victimizers and the victimized. And people always want, particularly on social media, to be on the side of the victimized, right? And Jews are somehow never the victimized, they're always the victimizers. Now the problem with the whole thing is that binary, because the world is not binary. No. The world is complicated, and good and evil particularly are very rarely a binary. And if anything, Jews are a massive glitch in the matrix of that binary. Okay, we're 100,000 Jews here in Brazil. Yeah. And like 60, 70,000 live in Sao Paulo. Yeah, and they're all coming tonight. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, I'd like you to leave a message to our viewers who are Jews and non-Jews. Okay. So you just want a big Christmas message, basically. If, if it's a Christmas <laughs> message, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. Okay. You know. Uh, well, okay, so to the Jews, what I would say is it's quite, you can read my book uh, and what I say and get, maybe get quite depressed, uh, and so I do. I'm, I'm quite a depressive person, and so I sometimes think I'm basically describing a mindset that uh, is quite embedded and also seems to be getting worse, okay? But there's one thing, and actually I'm going to mention my, another book I wrote, I wrote another book called The God Desire, which is about being a Jewish atheist, which is what I am. Mm -hmm. And in th that I talk about one of the things I deeply love about Jews is, is Jewish survival, is despite what I'm talking about, which is years and years and years of persecution and a new type of persecution now, Jews somehow manage to survive. So I'm going to say to the Jews watching, even though you might think this is a bad time, we tend to survive. So we're good at survival. Uh, and what I would say to the non-Jews is, well, the non-Jews who are not anti-Semites, you should be pleased about that because Jews in general bring culture and life and humor and comedy to the world. So Jews are generally a good thing. And to the anti-Semites, I will say, can I say fuck off or not? Not on this channel. Uh, you already said it. Okay. <laughs> okay, David, thank you very much. Thank you. That was a, it was a, a pleasure. A pleasure to talk to you as well. Mosaico volta já já. No Safra, nós aprendemos de geração em geração que um banco se constrói como um barco, sólido, para enfrentar com segurança qualquer tempestade. Essa é a nossa essência. Assim é o nosso barco. Estamos há mais de 180 anos navegando por todos os tipos de mares e tormentas do mercado financeiro. Se você quer um banco para cuidar do seu patrimônio, procure o barco e o banco dos especialistas. Quem sabe, Safra. O moderno Estado de Israel está comemorando 75 anos e esse é o momento de aproveitar as inúmeras atrações de Tel Aviv, visitar os pilares da fé em Jerusalém, renovar suas energias no Mar Morto, ligar-se com a natureza no deserto do Negev. Viagem para a Terra Santa com a Maringá, passagens a partir de 864 dólares. Conte com especialistas que proporcionam experiência, segurança e suporte 24 horas. Fale com a Maringá Turismo. 60 anos de viagens perfeitas. Anuncie na revista mais lida da comunidade. Revista A Hebraica. Ligue 3815-9159. O Mosaicult selecionou conteúdos israelenses disponíveis na Netflix para todo mundo curtir. Vamos assistir? Fala daí, Laís! Olá, pessoal! Está começando mais um Mosaicult. Hoje falaremos de atrações para todos os gostos que estão no catálogo da Netflix. Vamos nessa? 3, 2, 1, ação! Nossa primeira dica é uma série israelense chamada Jornada de Heróis de 2018. Anos após um rompimento doloroso, quatro amigos, veteranos do exército, se reúnem e viajam à Colômbia em busca de uma pessoa querida que achavam estar morta. 
A série, criada por Omer e Givon, foi transmitida pela primeira vez em Israel, no Canal 12, em maio de 2018, e é vagamente baseada no romance homônimo de Amir Goodfreud. Jornada de Heróis ganhou o prêmio de melhor série no Festival de Séries em Cannes, em 2018. <risos> בוניקה, מה שלך? מה לעשות? החיים המשיכו. טבעתת בהם, מישהו היה צריך להישאר פה, לנקות את הלכלוך, לאסוף אחר כך את כל השברים. A próxima indicação é a comédia Maktub, de 2018. Steve e Shuma, dois criminosos, são os únicos sobreviventes de um ataque terrorista em um restaurante em Jerusalém. Esse acontecimento provoca na dupla uma mudança de vida. Eles então resolvem transformar em realidade os pedidos que as pessoas deixam entre as pedras do Muro das Lamentações. O filme faz muito sucesso e continua figurando nas listas de melhores comédias disponíveis na Netflix. nossa última indicação é o reality show recém lançado Casamento à Moda Judaica. My name is Eliza Ben Shalom and I am a matchmaker and dating coach. Judeus e judias solteiros procuram a experiente casamenteira Eliza Ben Shalom na busca pelo par ideal nos Estados Unidos e em Israel. With the Jewish community where I have helped over 200 couples to get to the chuppah. Alisa Ben Shalom é uma casamenteira e consultora de encontros com um histórico impressionante de resultados positivos, os Tidar. A série tem os mesmos produtores de Casamento à Indiana, reality de sucesso que já está na sua terceira temporada. I need passion. Animal lover. Blonde or blue eyes or, you know, bigger, uh -huh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I do feel immense amount of pressure. You're supposed to be married and have children. I'm like the only one in Kansas that is a Jew of my color. As an Orthodox Jewish woman, if you're 28, people make comments. You're such a great girl. How are you still single? Um, all like amazing questions. Well, cheers. The rule of thumb is date them until you hate them. Red flags. Boy energy. There were two big red flags. One was that she was a vegan, and one was that she had two cats. Wow. Yeah. I definitely was into him. There was chemistry. How big is his mezuzah? <laughs> I have the hardest job in the world. And if you don't believe me, just try doing it. <laughs> Jornada de Heróis, Maktub e Casamento à Moda Judaica estão disponíveis na Netflix. E todas essas informações vocês também encontram em nossas redes sociais. Nós estamos como Mosaico na TV em todas elas. É isso aí, pessoal. Espero que vocês tenham gostado das nossas indicações. E eu espero vocês no próximo Mosaico. Tchau! No Pinata Música de hoje tem uma apresentação da cantora Fortuna.
salía, miraba en el cielo y en la estrella, vi de una luz santa en la judería que había de nacer Abraham Avino. Abraham Avino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Abraham Avino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. La mujer de Tera quedó preñada. De día en día él le preguntaba ¿De qué tenéis la cara tan demudada? Ella ya sabía el que tenía Abraham Madino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel Abraham Madino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel De día en día él le preguntaba ¿De qué tenéis la cara tan demudada? Ella ya sabía el bien que tenía Habrá movido, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel Habrá movido, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel Lembrando a todos que vocês podem rever todos os conteúdos do Mosaico a qualquer hora, no nosso canal no YouTube, estamos lá facinho, é só buscar Mosaico na TV. Certo? Na próxima sexta-feira, acenda as velas de Shabbat, às 18h34. O Kabbalah Shabbat da Beitel, Rua Caça Pava 105, acontece de forma virtual e presencial, mediante a inscrição. Tudo que é bom dura pouco, nós já vamos ficando por aqui. Cuidem-se todos, até o próximo programa. Shalom! Leitraot! Tchau, tchau, gente!